Even in the most straightforward of cases, it can be difficult to make sense of a crime as extreme as murder. When that crime is committed by someone very young, the implications are even darker, forcing us to grapple with deep psychological questions regarding the nature and causes of human evil. This inevitably leads to broader considerations about what to do with young offenders. Do we hold them fully responsible for their actions, or is there something else at play? To what extent is age a factor? If we choose to lock them away, for how long? And is there hope of rehabilitation, even in the most severe cases? Though these crimes are thankfully very rare, it's not hard to understand why they tend to attract so much attention, even long after they're considered settled legal matters. Today, we wanted to take a look at a few of these such cases, focusing on murders committed by young people that we found truly disturbing. Before we get to our list, don't forget to subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. With that out of the way, here are five chilling stories of murder committed by minors. On August 2nd, 1993, the parents of four-year-old Derek Robbie were terrified to learn that their son was missing when they went to pick him up from a local day camp in Steuben County, New York. Derek had reportedly never arrived that morning, prompting a frantic search of the surrounding community. Just four hours later, the young boy's body was sadly discovered in a wooded area not too far away. However, the case was about to get even more shocking when 13-year-old Eric Smith confessed to Derek's murder. Smith had been riding his bike to the same day camp earlier that day when he spotted the young boy walking alone. He lured Derek into the wooded area where he proceeded to strangle him, drop a large rock on his head, and remove his clothes before sexually assaulting him with a tree limb. According to reports, Smith had been previously diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, a mental condition that caused him to be violent and unpredictable that was rarely seen at his age. Smith himself would later say that he came from a troubled home, where he was routinely abused by members of his family. He was also known to be significantly bullied elsewhere in his life for the size of his ears, his glasses, and his red hair and freckles. Smith claimed that the murder was his way of coping with the rage he felt for his tormentors. On August 6, 1994, Smith was convicted of second-degree murder and received the maximum term available at the time for young offenders, a minimum of nine years to life in prison. Though he has expressed considerable remorse for his crime over the years, he has been considered a danger to the public by the parole board, which has denied him release a total of 10 times since his incarceration began. He will not be eligible for parole again until October of 2021. On the afternoon of April 23, 2006, police in Medicine Hat, Alberta, received an unsettling call about the Richardson family. A young boy who had come to play with the family's eight-year-old son, Tyler Jacob, received no answer at the door, but thought he saw something strange through the windows of the home. When police entered, they made a terrible discovery. Inside were the bodies of 42-year-old Mark Richardson, his wife Deborah, and their son, Tyler Jacob. The couple's 12-year-old daughter, Jasmine, was nowhere to be found. Though police initially feared that Jasmine had also either been killed or abducted, it wouldn't take too long to learn the shocking truth. The 12-year-old had murdered her entire family with the help of her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke. Investigators would later learn that tensions between Jasmine and her family over the relationship with Steinke had been one of the motivations behind the murders. Her parents did not approve of the significant age difference between the two, especially considering how young their daughter was. Though there are contradicting stories about how Jasmine and Steinke met, the two appeared to have bonded over shared interest in vampires and goth culture. Online, both discussed their interest in death and violent imagery, but Steinke in particular seemed to exhibit bizarre behavior. He is alleged to have told friends that he was a 300-year-old werewolf and reportedly wore a small vial of blood around his neck because he liked the taste of blood. The day after the discovery of the triple murder, Jasmine and Steinke were arrested in the town of Leader, Saskatchewan, about 130 kilometers away from Medicine Hat. They were both tried and convicted on three counts of first-degree murder. Jeremy Steinke received 25 years in prison and will be eligible for parole sometime in the 2030s. Jasmine Richardson received the maximum penalty of 10 years in prison under Canada's Youth Criminal Justice Act to be served in a psychiatric institution. She is believed to be the youngest person in the country convicted on multiple murder charges. She completed her sentence and was officially released from all further supervision in May of 2016.
In December of 1968, a conviction in the murder cases of two young boys received massive attention in the British press. However, this attention had less to do with the victims of the crimes than their perpetrator. The killer was an 11-year-old girl named Mary Bell, who had strangled a three-year-old and a four-year-old just two months apart earlier that year. The crimes were deeply disturbing, not just because of the age of both the victims and the killer, but because of their brutality. The second murder in particular had involved significant mutilation of the body after death, with Mary Bell reportedly carving an M into the boy's abdomen and using scissors to further damage the corpse. Though many of the stories written about Mary at the time focused on her diagnosis of psychopathy, her life before her conviction offers a more complete picture of her chilling crimes. Mary grew up in extremely abusive conditions. Her mother was a prostitute who forced her to engage in sexual acts with her clients from a very young age. On top of this, her mother reportedly tried to kill her several times. On one occasion, Mary was given an overdose of sleeping pills. Another time, she was said to fall out of a window under suspicious circumstances. Later investigation would show that Mary had suffered damage to the prefrontal cortex of her brain. These circumstances appear to have been at least partially considered in court, as she was found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. However, she was considered to be a danger to society, and was sentenced to be held, quote, at Her Majesty's pleasure, a form of indefinite detention practiced in the UK that is often used in cases involving young offenders. Mary Bell served time in several prisons, but was eventually released in 1980 after serving 12 years. She was given a new identity and had a daughter four years after her release. Though once again became the subject of controversy when reporters discovered her location in 1998. The pair were famously seen leaving their home with bedsheets over their heads to protect their identities. In May of 2003, Mary Bell won a high court battle to have the legal anonymity of her and her daughter extended for life, resulting in court orders protecting the identity of ex-convicts in Britain, now often being referred to as Mary Bell orders. Rena Verk was a 14-year-old girl from the quiet middle-class suburb of View Royal, British Columbia. She belonged to a devout religious family, and unlike many South Asian families in her local community, her parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. Because of her strict upbringing, Rena often rebelled against her parents' rules, even briefly running away when she was 13 and being temporarily placed in a group home. Rena's sense of isolation reportedly continued at school, where she struggled with body image and self-esteem issues. More than anything, she simply wanted to fit in. On the evening of November 14, 1997, Rena joined a group of teens partying near the Craigflower Bridge near their school. There, the teens planned to drink, smoke, and talk. When Rena didn't return home that night, her parents contacted the police. Though she was initially considered a runaway, rumors about what had happened to Rena were bubbling just under the surface among the teens in the local area. They would continue to circulate for eight days before the horrifying truth would begin to be uncovered. On November 22nd, Rena's partially clothed body was found by police after washing ashore in the Gorge Inlet, not far from the Craigflower Bridge. Though the cause of death was drowning, Rena had been severely beaten before her death and also had several burn marks from cigarettes on her body. In a packed news conference, investigators revealed the shocking details of Rena's murder. She had not been killed by a family member or an unknown predator. She had been killed by a small group of teens hanging out at the bridge that night. In all, six people had contributed to the beating death of Rena Verk, all of whom were 16 years old or younger. They would come to be known as the Shoreline Six. Five girls and one boy had savagely punched, kicked, and burned her with cigarettes as she struggled to defend herself. Sadly, the story didn't end there. Though Rena was badly beaten by the group, the crowd was eventually dispersed, leaving her severely injured but able to begin staggering home. It was then that two people from her group of attackers, 16-year-old Warren Glowatsky and 15-year-old Kelly Ellard, decided to continue attacking Rena. They dragged her to the other side of the bridge and beat her once again, rolling her unconscious body into the water after they were finished. Several people involved in Rena Verk's murder received sentences ranging from 60 days to one year in jail, but Glowatsky and Ellard were tried as adults for their role in the crime. Both were convicted of second-degree murder and given life sentences. Today, the story of Rena Verk is rightly considered a national tragedy and one that continues to feature in books, movies, and other artistic works in Canada. On the afternoon of February 12, 1993, two-year-old James Bulger disappeared while with his mother Denise at the New Strand Shopping Centre in Merseyside, England. 
Denise had taken her eyes off of her son momentarily while at a butcher's shop, but quickly realized that something was seriously wrong. Sadly, James was not found until two days later, when his mutilated body was discovered on a railway line roughly four kilometers from where he had been abducted. Unfortunately, that was just the beginning of the horrifying details in the case. CCTV footage released from the shopping center revealed that James had been taken by two young boys, who were quickly identified as 10-year-olds Robert Thompson and John Venables. In one of the most chilling and sad images imaginable, James could be seen holding the hand of one of his abductors while being led out of the mall. The boys would later reveal that they had skipped school that day, hanging around the shopping center and stealing various items while also looking for a child to target. Though they had originally planned to push their victim into oncoming traffic, when they abducted James, they decided on something far more brutal. After arriving at the secluded area of the railway line, Venables and Thompson began torturing James, throwing modeling paint in his eyes before kicking him and stomping on him. They also threw bricks and stones at him, finally dropping a 10 kilogram metal bar on his head. The pathologist in the case stated that James suffered so many injuries that it was impossible to determine which one had been the fatal blow. Police also could not rule out sexual assault in the attack, as many articles of James's clothing had been removed, including his underwear. On November 24, 1993, Venables and Thompson were found guilty of the murder of James Bulger, becoming the youngest convicted murderers in modern British history. Much like Mary Bell, they were sentenced at Her Majesty's pleasure, a type of indefinite detention often used in severe cases involving young offenders. Though both boys were subsequently released in 2001, John Venables has since returned to prison several times, most recently in 2017, on charges of possessing indecent images of children. To this day, the murder of James Bulger remains one of the most shocking and well-known cases in the history of England. That brings us to the end of our list. Are there any stories like this that you think we should cover in a future video? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.